Good morning and welcome to our educational webinar, What's Under the Tarp? Uh, our topic today will be Emerging Mycotoxin Issues and Strategies. My name is Pat Frasco. I'm the Director of Sales for the Milling, Grain, and Pet Food Group here at Neogen. It's my pleasure today to have a pair of really international experts in the field of mycotoxins joining us to present uh, their facts and research. Um, First, we're going to have Dr. Duarte Diaz, Associate Professor from the University of Arizona in Tucson. And also joining us today will be Dr. Gwendolyn Jones, Head of Product Marketing at Anco Animal Nutrition, and she is joining us from Austria. But many of you probably know that Neogen posts uh, weekly during the growing season and the harvest season what we call the Monday Mycotoxin and Crop Reports. These are you know, weekly reports uh, that we, we produce uh, trying to gather relevant data from the USDA, various weather services, and provide highlights of the crop condition, the weather progress highlights. In particular, we, we uh, focus on things like the drought maps that are produced each week. Uh, we look at you know, abnormal weather uh, as it relates to heavier than normal rainfall, uh, as well as temperature variances and, and crop progress and crop health. And then we, as harvest rolls on, we, we give updates about you know, the number of acres harvested at any given time. So also part of what this report is our mycotoxin incident maps. Uh, it's really where I think a lot of the uh, emphasis is placed. And, and we provide these incident maps uh, to reflect toxin levels that are at or above you know, concern levels. Uh, concern levels certainly can vary depending on the industry, uh, the toxin, the, the particular commodity, uh, but what we're providing, what we hope are early warning signs with, with these confirmed reports. Uh, these are uh, reports from a variety of different sources, um, grain elevators, grain labs, ethanol producers, uh, flour millers, corn millers, uh, pet food industry, and samples that may come into our lab. So we're, we're getting a composite of a lot of different information. Uh, but in the reports and we, when we post uh, to the maps, uh, we, we always want to try to make sure people understand that this is not a predictive model. Uh, it's not a representative survey of all the toxin levels that might be in a particular region or a state. And it's also not intended to be what I call micro-targeting. We're not trying to specifically say that a particular county in a particular state is where the problem is. Uh, that would be uh, really beyond the scope of the data that we collect, nor what we would feel would be truly representative. Uh, so because of that, these are uh, quite a number of reports that we do get that we think still has value, even though they may not be providing shall we say, statistical analysis in terms of the average toxin level or min-max level uh, within, the, uh, within a given state. But we think it's a broad overview that's very, very important nonetheless. And having these diverse sources gives a snapshot of what the upper range or the upper quartile of toxins are in the major uh, commodities, particularly corn, uh, barley and the various uh, classes of, of wheat. When we do produce a, a number on a map, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a little bit, we, we try to express those in a greater than level. Uh, that's not to say that that's the highest level that we found in a particular state. Uh, in many cases, it's, it's not. We actually have levels that are typically over those upper ranges, but we're trying to present what we think is a, um, a measured but appropriate risk analysis that a particular area um, may have higher levels of a toxin in a given year. And, and the final takeaway is that your levels will vary um, and so not to assume that because Neogen says it's a certain level uh, that that's what you're going to find. And I think the other uh, takeaway disclaimer uh, on that I would give everyone today is that if we don't have a level in a particular state that we report, that doesn't mean it's free of that toxin. It just happens to mean we don't have sufficient incidents and uh, of levels uh, to to make a uh, an analysis that, that a certain area may may be higher than normal risk and then we, we roll up all these reports into a capstone report 
that we post at the end of the year, and, and that's really uh, uh, what has been last been posted here, uh, I think, in early December. Let's go to the next one. So kind of moving forward, uh, 2016 was, was quite, quite a uh, year for U.S. corn production, another record year, 15.2 billion bushels, uh, increase over uh, the crop year of 2015 that produced roughly 13.6 billion bushels of corn. Uh, so that, again, setting records is, uh, is something that we're accustomed to in U.S. agriculture. And so having an emphasis on how this applies to the, cor the storage um, component, I think, is, is, is something we wanted to share today. Um, USDA reports on January 12th that the on-hand stocks, that's just you know, a term of what's in inventory based on government records, about 7.6 billion bushels that are on the farm. And another 4.8 billion bushels is what they call off-farm corn and storage. You might view that as the, the commercial grain elevators or, or, the, or the handlers of grain uh, rather than the actual producers and growers. And that represents an, a respective 11% and 10% growth over prior year at the same point. I think it's, it's also, I think, very relevant to note that with that 7.6 billion bushels that are on the farm, roughly you know, fully a half of of the total U.S. corn production is in the farmer's hands on, on their farm and storage. Most of that grain, I would suspect in saying, is has never been tested for mycotoxin. So we, we have no way to determine what might be that, that level in. But certainly within the grain handling system, grain elevators, you know, they've, they've done some uh, screening and some analysis. Uh, but my point would be is that we only have a snapshot so far of what this corn crop looked like in terms of its toxin uh, components. Um, just kind of adding on to the, the, the point about storage and why storage is so critical, the sheer volume of grain again this year from U.S. soybean production was also a record of 4.36 billion bushels. And that obviously together with the high corn uh, production uh, not to mention, you know, pretty good wheat production and, and carryover of the prior year stresses the grain storage system and so that all forms and types of storage are required. Uh, certainly everything is filled uh, to the brim uh, in most, you know, grain producing areas, concrete silos, metal bins, flat storage, bunkers, uh, you know, ground piles, uh, as well as uh, grain sacks or grain bags that are becoming a little more popular and necessary because of the of the overwhelming abundance of grain in the U.S. this year. So, taking this step, you know, forward, you know, what is heavy uh, heavy production equal uh, high inventory levels, a long carry, and in the grain business that equates to low prices, and the unconventional storage becomes necessary, uh, but that also carries with it. Uh, elements of uh, managing the crop going forward. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that now. So when we posted our capstone report in early December, we had a pretty fair idea of uh, the DON was high this year in corn, quite prevalent. As you can see from this map, uh, apologize if that clarity isn't real real great, but from Iowa or Nebraska, you know, over four parts uh, per million, Iowa five, Wisconsin five or higher, Illinois at three, the states of uh, Indiana and Ohio and parts of southern Michigan were probably the hardest hit. Uh, levels of, of well over five, seven, eight, ten parts per million were quite common in those states. And then throughout you know, Pennsylvania, um, New York, and even into southern uh, Canada and Ontario had, had levels of, of high uh, DON in corn. You know, DON is uh, obviously driven in part by a cool cooler and more rainy uh, weather patterns, uh, and it has very significant impact to the ethanol industry, as one uh, clearly knows if you're in, in the feed and grain and ethanol space, you understand how, how serious this has been to those producers uh, in, the, in the eastern corn belt because of distillers' grains and the consumption of, of corn from this area. So it, it is something that was well on the radar back in December. But also on the radar in December in our capstone report, we were seeing signs of high xerelinone, another famonis and mold, 
Uh, Iowa had par, parts per million, or pardon me, 1,300 uh, ppb. Uh, that again was was quite high and, and quite unusual. Uh, Zarelinone typically does go hand in hand with DON. We see that um, typically, and because it is grown by similar uh, environmental and weather conditions, again, cool, wet weather, late planted acres, uh, all all play into a role in Zarelinone development. But just quickly, a couple of points about uh, aflatoxin and famonisin. I don't have them on these maps, but 2016 was a reasonably light year for aflatoxin, relatively speaking. Uh, we did see aflatoxin levels in, in Texas and across the south and uh, you know, parts of the uh, southern plains in the 20 to 50 uh, range parts per billion, some isolated parts of 100. Uh, famonisin was also a bit more prevalent this year in the western and central Corn Belt states and uh, across the south uh, as well. Moving forward or post-harvest, I guess, uh, after our capstone report, we, we continue to collect data and uh, the numbers quite surprisingly or maybe not so surprisingly continue to get higher. The DON reports, you know, continue to uh, on, as you can see from this map with the, the red dots uh, in the ovals on, on the side of the legend. Uh, but the thing that really started to get our attention was that we started to see much more Zarela known post-harvest. Uh, in the case of Indiana, Illinois, started to see ranges above you know, 1,300 to 15 and even 1,600 parts per billion, uh, in addition to Iowa's high level. Um, Ohio also had some high reports over 1,400, and you know, some reports, although they were a bit lower in the southwest and Texas and Arizona. Uh, the other uh, fusarium mold that actually really got our attention post-harvest was T2. Not a toxin that we're accustomed to seeing in the U.S. most years, and we were seeing examples of it in not only corn, but corn gluten meal and dry distillers grains. Um, the map here shows those in a legend, a little bit of a brownish colored diamond shape. Uh, I would want to emphasize the fact while those particular reports uh, you know, came to us through third-party uh, labs in, in uh, from Illinois to the southeast uh, to the New England area. I, I would not want anyone to take away the impression that that is a specific indication that those are the states where the T2 may actually have originated in source because they did include um, grain and grain ingredients that moves through the corn storage system, through the processing channels, but it is showing evidence in these uh, finished feed products and corn as well. And we thought this is, uh, this is something that's really different and that it's made this year, I think, a, a more significant year to be concerned about storage going forward. So I guess the question you know, is often comes up is well, why the increase in toxin levels now? Um, I think any good sound mycotoxin management and mitigation program really has to look at risk uh, in what I would call a holistic approach. Uh, storage conditions matter. Um, the proper handling of the grain at harvest is, is vitally important. Uh, the drying of that grain to 14.5% is important before going into storage, you know, cleaning the corn, removing the foreign material, uh, and having a screening program for your toxins. So to the extent that you can segregate grain by, by some toxin measure or range, will allow a, a, a measure of control of toxins if you can identify early where the risks are most prevalent. But again, the year that we've had, the storage challenges that we've had, that from a practical standpoint is a big, big challenge is that I'm, I'm well aware uh, that it's not as easy to segregate. However, the absence of that segregation obviously impacts the uh, the overall grain in the storage. But there are measures that can be used to mitigate and control quality in storage. I don't want to get into too much detail on them, but they involve things like, you know, managing airflow, managing the temperature of the grain uh, against ambient outside temperatures. There's, you know, CO2 monitoring systems and a variety of other um, methods. Uh, but with all of those uh, best practices, and they certainly are employed in, in, uh, with good sound grain management storage uh, uses, things still can go wrong. And I think that's, 
that's the the word of caution if if I could offer any here today is that everyone that's involved in the grain handling system uh, you need to be mindful of those leaky roofs the sidewalls that are leaking is the are the tarps in place because there's things happening beyond the, the superstructure of the facilities that you can't control mother nature will put through the winter, you'll go through freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw cycles. It'll snow, it'll rain, it'll snow, it'll rain. Uh, and that constant change of weather and managing those external environmental conditions really adds extra stress, extra pressure on, on the grain storage that you have. With that, I think it's safe to, to, to say as a word of caution is that all molds under the right conditions can grow in storage, although certainly best management practices can do a lot to control and mitigate that. But the grain handling system, I again come back to the fact that it is a holistic approach that one needs to take in understanding grain quality and particularly mycotoxin management risks starts at the farm, follows through the grain elevator and the storage systems to the processor, to the, you know, the broker handler, to the exporter, and, and to the final user. Um, and I think at the, uh, at the end of the day, food safety plans need to take into account this holistic approach to food safety from a mycotoxin standpoint and understand that the storage risk components uh, obviously are critically important to be managed, uh, but it's not just something that's managed one time at harvest or one time at, at the first point of, uh, of receipt. My next presenter, we're going to be able to uh, transfer over is Dr. Duarte Diaz, Associate Professor at University of Arizona, and his, uh, his title will be Mycotoxin Productions in Grains. Dr. Diaz holds his master's degree and PhD in nutrition from North Carolina State University. His research for the past 15 years is focused on the effects of mycotoxins on agriculture. Publisher of 70 articles in scientific journals, Dr. Diaz served as an editor of a publication that focused on the implied impact of mycotoxins titled The Mycotoxin Blue Book, widely considered an important reference uh, on this subject. Dr. Diaz has worked in the academic area as well as the private sector. He's currently on the faculty of the University of Arizona as associate professor and a dairy extension specialist. Um, thank you. Uh, I first wanted to um, thank the, the sponsors, uh, Neogen and some of the other sponsors for organizing this uh, timely um, webinar. I also wanted to thank uh, all the participants. I, I always un understand that you guys are, are very busy and taking time out of your day to spend one hour with us is, 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 a, is a great sacrifice. Um, with that in mind, I, I typically, this is where I start getting a little bit uh, self-conscious, and, and this is where I, I like to put my disclaimers. Um, uh, I am going to talk about a lot of things today. I'm going to talk about mycology, plant pathology, agronomy, uh, climate and weather patterns and phenomena, statistics and chemistry. Um, but I'm neither a mycologist, a plant pathologist, an agronomist, a meteorologist, or any of those things. Uh, uh, I'm simply a, a biologist. I'm, I'm really interested in, in the interactions uh, that occur between uh, moles, plants, animals, humans, systems. Uh, I think that to me is, is what has been historically very fascinating about the field of, of mycotoxins. And, and I, I think in essence that's, that's where I, I, I get the most satisfaction when I, when I have the opportunity to talk about this, this subject. Uh, what I will say is that uh, you will probably leave this webinar with probably as many questions as you came in. Uh, this is a fairly new field. We, we still are in the discovery stages of a lot of the things that, that, that we will talk about. So what I will try to, to do today is present some of the data or some of the information that has been uh, done through research models and try to combine that with some of our experiences uh, in the field uh, to try to make sense or at least make some sense of, of what happens in, in these types of, of situations. Um, when we talk about fusarium disease, we primarily focus on two things. Uh, one is uh, red ear rot or uh, gibberella uh, ear rot, uh, which um, it's, it's a predominant uh, corn uh, problem in, in many regions of the United States and, and North America. 
uh, and we also, also sometimes talk about the fusarium era, which is actually pretty pretty consistent uh, uh, problem in the United States. Um, not always symptomatically, but we, we have a pretty uh, consistent uh, occurrence of, of those types of issues. Uh, both of those are associated with fusarium on uh, most species, but both of them are associated with a very different uh, type of fusarium um, species. Uh, the uh, Fusarium urat is mostly a uh, Fusarium verticilloides uh, problem, and it's mostly associated in weather patterns that are a little warmer. Um, it also is more commonly associated with some type of injury or some type of damage to the kernel affecting its, its capacity to, to shield itself from, from the mold uh, in there. Um, the, the red urat, uh, which is primarily uh, uh, associated with Fusarium graminarium is, is probably what we, we mostly saw this year uh, and it's typically a little different in, in its um, epidemiology uh, or in, in, in its, its disease pattern. Uh, it's mostly associated with a little colder weather. It's also associated with uh, rainfall, um, mostly during the silking process. Uh, the process is extremely complex and I still think there's a lot of areas that we don't understand that well, uh, particularly as it pertains to corn. Uh, we do know a lot more about fusarium head blight uh, in wheat um, than we do know about um, um, corn uh, problem. But uh, in essence, these, these uh, molds uh, produce uh, a wide range of mycotoxins. Uh, the graminarium is, is a particular uh, mold strain because it produces type A trichotesines, type B trichotesines, it produces zeralinone, uh, and it can all produce those in either uh, the same sequence of production or in different um, aspects of that uh, life cycle. So it makes it it makes for a very complex uh, mold disease toxin production um, scenario. So in general, um, fusarium disease uh, is is and mycotoxin production is is influenced by environmental growing conditions. As I said before, either warm or or colder weather, depending on which strain we're talking about. Uh, but but rain is also a pretty important uh, component of it, both in the actual spreading of the spores, uh, but also in creating that atmosphere that is ideal for the the grain uh, and mold to to interact. Uh, it's also very significantly affected by agronomic systems, and I'm going to talk to, about that a little bit more in detail a little later on. But that's just something that I think we need to keep in mind. Uh, because uh, if, if weather continues to look as it has been in the past couple of years, what we'll see is that uh, we'll have a lot of residues of fusarium in the field from the residues of the corn, uh, primarily because gramidarium performs this arcospore, which actually protects it from the environment uh, while it waits for a, 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 the next inoculant. So uh, there is there is a, a potential there to, to have more problems in in following years if, if we don't address this uh, in, in some uh, control strategy. One of the questions that I try to address in this model is to really focus on why we have an increasing concerns of mycotoxins. I think there's a lot of reasons why we have an increasing concern of mycotoxins. One of them is related to just basically we have more knowledge about mycotoxins. Uh, we have uh, a lot uh, better understanding of their effects and their, their, their uh, symptoms associated with production or disease in the plant or in the animals or even in human populations. So the advancements in the fields have been pretty significant over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, one of the main reasons we have more concerns is because we, we just look for them more often. We have better analytical methods. I, I, I constantly kid around and tell people that the easiest way not to have mycotoxins is not analyze for them. Uh, the more you look for them, the more sensitive your methods become, the more likely you're going to find them in, in, in more frequency. Um, over the years, the analytical procedures have, have evolved uh, quite rapidly. Uh, we have everything from you know, qualitative yes or no uh, assays to semi-quantitatives and fully quantitatives. We have methods that you know, the machine by itself costs you, you know, $500,000 and you need a PhD chemist to run through it. Uh, in essence, this is a subject of, uh, of some discussion in many circles because we, we often get hung up on what is the right method or the best method to, to analyze mycotoxins. But I, I want to 
take some time and, and talk a little bit about what I think is probably the most important thing in the analytical procedure for, for mycotoxins. When we, when we think about analytical procedure, most of us naturally think that the analytical procedure starts at the lab, right, when the lab receives the sample and prepares the sample. But in essence, uh, we, we must understand that the analytical procedure actually starts at the collection of the sample. Um, the sample needs to be representative of what that entire lot uh, in order to get valuable information or meaningful information from it. So on this diagram um, showing you here on the left, uh, it's just a, a, a typical test procedure, sampling uh, procedure, analytical procedure. And what I want you to focus is on those black arrows um, because each one of those arrows is a potential source of error in the system. So the collection of the sample, the first arrow, the second sample is the subsampling or the preparation of that sample. The third could be the analytical procedure. There could be some errors there. And finally, the, the results or the interpretation of the results by the, the lab or the analytical group. Um, and then I want you to focus on the, on the right-hand hand there uh, and, and see some of the data from Dr. Whitaker who spent a considerable amount of time of probably practically his whole career looking at uh, sampling protocols for mycotoxins. And what it actually states is that about 75.5% of the error associated with this procedure, so each one of those errors is a source of error, um, it's, it's in the collection of the sample. Uh, about 15% or 16% of the errors is, is in the preparation of that subsample, so how you process that sample before you collect the couple grams that you're going to use for the analytical. Um, and about only 8% of that error is actually in the analytical procedure. So again, we spent way too much time focusing on which analytical method is better when we probably need to spend a lot more time on, on sample collection and protocols that are specific for, for mycotoxin analysis. And the reason this, is, this occurs is because in many cases, moles occur sporadically, uh, not homogeneously distributed throughout that uh, feeding gradient, whether it occurs in the field or in the storage facility, it usually is areas where the conditions are best for their growth. Uh, and as a result, the mycotoxins that they produce are not going to be homogeneously distributed throughout that lot. So the more, uh, the, 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 the more uh, variation you have in that system there, the, the harder it is to collect that sample in a so that it's representative uh, of, of what your, uh, your entire lot is. So one, one of the simple keys to reducing uh, sample collection variation uh, is to increase the sample size. Again, this is some of the data from Dr. Whitaker, and it clearly states that, you know, just a five-fold increase in the size of your sample, and in this case meaning taking more smaller samples and mixing them together, but making that sample size a lot bigger, uh, we'll, cut, we'll cut the sampling variance uh, about 80%, uh, and then the total variance can be reduced about 60%. And I think this is really telling. Again, I, I like to tell people that you often collect samples for a lot of analysis, uh, but you have to consider that most of those things that you're asking are pretty homogeneously distributed in that feedlot. So, in uh, that feed or that commodity or that ingredient. So what I want you guys to, to think about is that if, if you're going to spend the time, the energy, the money to do mycotoxin analysis, you should be thinking about a specific mycotoxin sampling protocol in order to actually increase the value of that data that you're receiving from that process. Um, GIPSA and other agencies actually have pretty specific uh, mycotoxin sampling protocols. Sometimes they're a little bit uh, prohibitive. They're, they're very complex. They require very large sample size. But again, if, if you at least start from that endpoint, you, you can significantly impact the, the quality and the value of that information that you're getting uh, from the uh, analytical uh, pr procedure. Um, the other thing I think it's, it's really peculiar about mycotoxin uh, analysis and, and sample collection is that a lot of times we introduce uh, our own biases into the sampling uh, uh, process. You know, in many cases, when you want to find mycotoxins, you're, you're tempted or you're biased to go collect samples from the moldiest part of the feedstuff. Uh, sometimes when maybe you don't want to know uh, or you don't want to find those mycotoxins, you're tempted to go look at the, at the nicer looking kernels. Uh, in essence, a lot of these, these mycotoxins are not always associated with, with a physical presence uh, of the kernel or appearance of the kernels. Uh, sometimes there's very low correlation with grading system, although for some mycotoxins like 
aflatoxin and fumonisin there is. Um, in this example, you can clearly see that you know there's there's five uh, different uh, images here. Uh, the ones that look really really bad on your right are, are contaminated. Those levels are actually fairly high. Uh, but if you compare those to the two on the left, uh, where are more traditionally looking uh, kernels, you can see that there's a very big difference in contamination. That one kernel in the bottom left, um, it, it's enough to cause a lot of problems in, a, in an entire uh, production system, just one little kernel and at that level of contamination. So I think you, know, you also want to make sure that in those sampling protocols you remove all these potential biases in the system so that you are getting some valuable information uh, at the end. Um, the other uh, area of this mycotoxin, increase in mycotoxin cons concerns related to our, our increasing understanding on the occurrence, the effects, and, and other issues associated with mycotoxin production. Um, in general, however, we are still pretty uh, uh, in, the, in the diaper stages in our, our understanding of why these moles actually produce mycotoxins. We, we have three fairly good standing hypotheses, and in most cases they can be uh, there, there's examples of mycotoxin occurrences that are clearly associated with them. Uh, the primary one is response to stress. It's the one that we typically talk the most about. Uh, we see a lot of situations where the mole will grow uh, favorably in a certain condition and not produce mycotoxins. But as that mole is stressed, and even as that mole is actually dying, it starts producing uh, all sorts of mycotoxins. So again, this is this is pretty pretty common occurrence. We see it even and at the grain level, uh, storage level, when we're uh, inoculating with an uh, antifungal uh, product. Uh, the other one that's really actually pretty interesting is that uh, moles are in this micro ecosystems competing for this substrate. And they are potentially producing mycotoxins and other things to actually try to outcompete other microorganisms for that substrate. So, so they're utilizing these toxic compounds to thrive in certain environments. There's really some uh, neat uh, information out there about these, these competitive ex exclusion mechanisms. But again, one of the things that you can actually also point to is that a lot of these mycotoxins are actually antimicrobial, and some of them are even utilized for those purposes. So uh, it seems like it's, it's a pretty neat way that the moles are, are figuring out a way to outcompete. The last one there, uh, to me, is one of the most interesting. It's more specific, and it, it, it kind of talks to about a little bit what happened this year is, is that um, in some cases, these mycotoxins can produce these, these, these moles can produce these mycotoxins as a tool to allow them to propagate or spread throughout that substrate. Um, just give you a quick example. If you look at that little uh, wheat uh, uh, head there, um, what you can think about is if we take a fusarium graminarium non-DON producing strain and inject it in just one of those pickets, what will happen is that graminarium will grow just on that little spigot. But if we take a graminarium, or graminarium uh, strain that produces DON and just do the same protocol and we come back later, what we'll see is that the production of that DON causes irritation in the covering of all the other seed heads or some of the other seed uh, uh, heads there or the spigots and then allow that mold to propagate and that's what you see on the graph over there on the right uh, with that straight line on the bottom and the growth on the other ones uh, on DON producing strain. So it seems to be a pretty neat mechanism. Uh, the really interesting thing about that is that a lot of our data that we've looked at over the years seems to point that uh, for uh, at least trichotesians and fusarium related uh, contamination events, uh, DON seems to be one of the first toxins that we start seeing. And once the toxin starts getting at a cert to a cer certain level, is that we start seeing some of the other uh, fusarium produced mycotoxins. So it's very likely that what's happening is the, the mold is producing that uh, DON to allow it to spread, and then it's coming back and uh, as it thrives in the other uh, seeds, um, uh, allowing it to to produce other mycotoxins in other conditions. The other side of, of this equation, which is, I think, at least very interesting, is that it seems to be very high correlation with uh, environmental stresses that are associated with major events. Uh, and again, I, I think any, anybody can can argue one way or another, but, but it's pretty apparent that in the last 10 years or, or even 20 years, we have seen a um, higher incidence of environmental uh, climate related events 
Uh, and, and if you track those with mycotoxin events or high contamination mycotoxin events, uh, you can see that there is, seems to be a pretty, pretty good correlation there. And that is mostly related to that primary mechanism that I talked to you guys about uh, of those stresses uh, in the system that may help uh, the mold thrive in a different environment, but also stress the mold into the production of the mycotoxins. Uh, if we look at the last five or six years as a model, of how that is actually uh, affecting mycotoxin production, we can look at two primary things. The first one is the graph on the top. It actually shows you uh, temperature uh, uh, by year. And we've had in 2015 and 16, the two hottest years in record. Uh, there's, there's a pretty good trend moving in that direction. Uh, and sometimes we have those, those events that are associated with that um, increase in temperature. If you look at the, uh, the, the graph on the bottom, uh, essentially showing you El Nino in red and La Nina years. Uh, and then what you can see is the last part from 2000 and on, um, there, there seems to be a higher reoccurrence of those El Nino, La Nina types of events. And again, our ability to actually correlate those to mycotoxin, uh, high mycotoxin contamination events is, is, is shown, or at least is showing us that those, those things are, are fairly well related. So again, 2009 uh, crop year, 2010 harvest was a pretty particular year, very similar to the events that occur in this year, uh, maybe with one primary uh, uh, difference, but the concentration of the mycotoxins, the regions where occur, the climate that was associated with that occur, occurrence, like a, a Nino type uh, year, uh, were all very similar. Uh, what we saw in, in, in 2009 was extremely high concentrations of DON uh, samples, about 60% of the samples in, in some uh, uh, tests were exceeding one to seven parts per million. We had samples that were as high as, you know, 20 or 25 parts per million, pretty high levels, uh, more than uh, uh, we are typically accustomed to seeing. The other thing that we did see is a lot of the byproducts uh, associated with corn production also had fairly alarming levels. Again, on the bottom there you see uh, some DDGS samples. Again, 80% of those samples were within the 8 and to 25 uh, parts per million range. Again, we, we typically associate a threefold increase uh, from corn being utilized to produce DDGSs because of the concentration effect uh, through the processes. Uh, obviously, in this example, that's not cause and effect. Those are not the same corn used for DDGS. And in essence, I would say that DDGS contamination is not really a, a, a DDGS issue, it's, it's a corn issue. When you start with contaminated corn, you end up with contaminated DGS. I, I'm probably going way longer than I should, so I'm going to zoom through a couple of slides pretty quickly. Uh, 2011, post-year, was uh, a typical La Nina year. We had severe drought uh, in, in a lot of the traditional drought uh, areas. Uh, that translated into a, a typical mycotoxin map, but again, with the higher concentration of those uh, green diamonds that are associated with aflatoxin production. Uh, 2013 was an even more severe drought year, but then we had the traditional uh, shifting of uh, climate to the east, northeastern side, so we did see a lot of aflatoxin issues in the Midwestern region that typically is not associated with that contamination. So I'm going to skip this one really quick because it's, it's also explained on the next one. Uh, which I want you to focus here really quickly is this is an oceanic uh, Nino index, and basically the the uh, orange on the top uh, going uh, uh, north or going to, to the top is actually uh, uh, the temperature uh, index for El Nino. If, if it exceeds 0.5 or positive 0.5, that's what we start considering El Nino event. Uh, and the other end, the blue ones, if it exceeds or if it's lower than point negative 0.5, then we start thinking about a year. What you really want to focus, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but are the years like uh, 82, 83, uh, 72, 71, 72, uh, 98. What you see is that every time we have a major uh, La Nina event, what we have is a, is a pretty long, drawn out La Nina uh, occurrence. Um, in 2016, what we had was every indication of a pretty severe El Nino year based on the you know uh, the water temperatures and the, the wind currents and everything like like that um, we didn't really it didn't really materialize that way although we did have some of the effects uh, so what traditionally you would have expected was to see a very uh, drawn out uh, La Nina year uh, coming in here uh, it didn't show up in the slide but I had a, an added uh, some points in here 
Um, what we actually ended up seeing was was a very mild and very short three to four months La Nina period, and then again a climbing of the temperatures into El Nino type of event. So what happens is, for the first time probably as, as we've been able to record this, uh, we pretty much had no La Nina effect and we're going right back to El Nino effect. So again, that's that's pretty interesting and potentially alarming because again, I told you about the residues of the plant. Um, that could potentially lead to uh, problems in the upcoming years uh, with the same type of issues that we had. Um, again, I'm going to go really quick through this slide. This is basically to as a placeholder to tell you that once we have this contamination in the field, uh, the potential risk is not done. Again, this is just an example of what happens to grain as it's stored with a high concentration of molds in it. And this is independent of mycotoxin production. So again, if, you, if you're able to control that mold growth either by uh, having a very uh, low humidity or using a fungicide, in this example, the 12% or the 12% with the AF, um, if you compare to that to storing that material of 50% humidity, um, you can see that there is uh, at least some significant reduction in fat. Um, the energy value of that feed is, is going to be significantly impacted. And again, we can we can confirm that that's actually due to mold growth because if you use the fungicide like the last example here on the bottom, uh, you see that you can prevent that uh, potential uh, uh, loss in, in energy in that feed stuff. Again, one of the things that Pat mentioned and I want to make sure that, that people understand is uh, because we historically have classified, classified mycotoxins as storage toxins and, and, and field toxins, um, we, we have to um, consider that they, um, sorry, my screen went blank there for a second. We have to consider that they still have the potential of producing mycotoxins in uh, the storage environment or in the field environment. I'll give you a primary example. In Arizona, most of our aflatoxin contamination occurs in the field, even though aflatoxin is what we consider uh, a storage uh, mycotoxin contaminant. The same thing happens with, with uh, some of the uh, trichotesines uh, and potential uh, growth in the storage condition. Again, the example of the T2 contamination could be a very clear example of, of what that's happening, that that material is actually being stored at a much higher uh, moisture content than it, than it should be. And as a result, it's it's actually creating more uh, growth uh, opportunities. Uh, the last thing I wanted to stress um, is just quickly to think about what's going to happen in the future. Here are two uh, uh, great research studies done over the last couple of years uh, showing basically uh, what happens if fields are inoculated with a uh, mycotoxin producing strain. In both cases, we're looking at Fusarium gram and Arum uh, producing uh, DON. Uh, on the left side, what you see is that the difference in contamination between a, a, a no-till uh, and a heavy-till um, ingredients there. And basically what you see is that when you don't we, when you don't till, you leave that material on the ground untouched and you're creating an environment for that next crop to be uh, contaminated in there. Um, and again, the opposite is, is the, on the other side, on the, on the right-hand side, is basically looking at the difference between uh, reducing that event uh, if you till, and basically what they're showing is you can get over 30% reduction in reoccurrence of that mycotoxin and concentration of that mycotoxins uh, if you just do uh, some type of processing in the field. Um, fungicides have been historically not that great at, at reducing, and even uh, some other fertilizer strategies have also not been. Tilling seems to be one of the, the best ways to, to, to do that. Um, I have actually gone way past my time, um, but I, I just wanted to conclude by talking, telling you guys this is still a fairly new field. Uh, we still have many unanswered questions. Um, I think the analytical tools are helping us advance, um, maybe sometimes too fast. Uh, uh, being able to detect things at parts per trillion, uh, I sometimes wonder if that's actually really useful, uh, at least for, for the field component. Uh, there's other tools that are coming out that potentially will help us maybe even also analyze at the animal exposure level. Uh, but again, it's it's a multidisciplinary effort. Uh, uh, the other thing that I think it's really important is, is to keep an eye on the uh, legislation. I think as, as as trade treaties and other things come uh, into play, we 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 get into these discussions about uh, legislation uh, restraints. Um, you will see in the next presentation that Europe has a, a very different 
uh, regulatory component of, of mycotoxin control and uh, it's not always better to be uh, more restricted if, if, if we don't really understand what the actual risk or what the potential to uh, prevent those situations are. So uh, with that, I, I want to stop because I, I've definitely gone way over my time. Duarte, thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, presentation will be uh, by Dr. Gwendolyn Jones from ANCO. Uh, Dr. Jones has 15 years of commercial experience in the animal feed industry, employed by global companies such as Bioman. Uh, her experience includes three years as a technical manager based in the U.S. and gaining insights into animal feed and production across the U.S. Holds her Ph.D. in pig nutrition from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, MBA from the University of Iowa, now working at ANCO, an Austrian company focused on feed solutions to deal with the nutritional stress and cost-effective diets. So, it's all yours, Gwendolyn. You got it now. So after the previous presentations, you are probably all wondering whether you have any reason to panic. And my job um, today is really to put the results of the current service into context and help you see um, what they actually mean for your operation so you can take appropriate action. And for, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be focusing on DON, Zeralanon, and T2 toxin because these are the mycotoxins, as Pat mentioned earlier, that are showing unusually high levels in current surveys. One logical step if you hear um, the results of mycotoxin surveys is obviously to look at regulatory guidelines um, on mycotoxin levels in, in um, animal feed. Just have a quick look um, on some of the regulatory guidelines and what I did here is compare regulatory guidelines of three different countries um, for Zeralanon. So you see the U.S. is actually not providing any um, guidelines on Zeralanon levels in feed, whereas Canada to some extent does and in EU is um, giving quite a few more um, guidelines on, on Zeralanon levels in, in the feed. And then when we look at T2 toxin, um, only Canada is actually providing some guidelines on T2, T2 toxin um, in animal feed, whereas the US and, and the EU, both of them, do not provide any guidelines. And DON, again, comparing the three countries, you can see actually for DON, um, each of the countries is providing guidelines, but the guidelines differ between the countries and also the guidelines differ between different species. As you can see, um, guidelines for mycotoxin tolerance levels in feed, they're a good start, but um, the YES or so FDA guidelines only give guidelines on aflatoxin, formonacin, and DON in animal feed. Guidelines do differ between um, different countries, and what they also do not take into account is that um, um, feed often is um, contaminated, so co-contaminated, and has different types of mycotoxins in the same feed, and that might actually um, necessitate um, different or lower action levels compared to what you will see in the guidelines and we'll talk about this later on in the presentation. Just a quick note for those of you who are not um, measuring mycotoxin levels on a daily basis, um, it's sometimes a little bit confusing you know in terms of how, how the measurements are actually expressed, sometimes they're expressed in milligrams per kilogram, sometimes as um, PPBM or PPB and this is just to show you how you can convert the different measurements. Um, so understand one milligram per kilogram equals one ppm, and that again um, equals 1,000 ppb. This is just important to know if you are now looking at some of the um, levels um, of mycotoxins in, in feed and how they impact um, animal performance. So if you do not want to um, put your bets on, on um, regulatory guidelines as to how this will impact um, performance in, in animals, no, mycotoxin levels impact performance in animals, there's another way of um, having a, more of an objective view on, on how they might be um, affecting your uh, animal performance. And this is looking at um, um, the results of meta-analysis studies. A meta-analysis study um, is a statistical analysis that combines the results of multiple um, um, scientific studies. So in here I'm providing you with an example um, of a meta-analysis carried out by Andretta et al. in 2012, and they looked at 85 um, pig trials out of the scientific literature and, and looked at the effects of Zeralanon and DON on growth performance parameters in pigs, so weaner, grower, and finisher pigs. 
As you can see here, um, DON actually quite significantly affects feed intake, growth rate, and FCR in pigs. And the average level um, reported in these 85 pig trials was um, 3.63 parts per million. I think it's always also very important to look at the actual levels that were reported um, in, in these trials. So here it was 3.63 ppm on average of those 85 trials. Um, then looking at Zeralinon, the average level of Zeralinon in these trials was 1.14 ppm in a diet. And you can see there there's no significant effect on either feed intake growth rate or FCAR reported by this meta-analysis. But there are some um, um, scientific uh, papers out there, like the one I quoted below, that will show that um, Zon um, can have some impact on, impact on nutrient digestibility, increased oxidative stress, and reduced growth rate. And this was um, actually at 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 ppm in the diet. But, you know, I think the 85 pig trials carried out, so the analysis carried out on the 85 pig trials carries a heavier weight and they don't show any significant effect on performance. When we look at the effect of ziralinone on fertility, that's a different picture. Um, I didn't find any meta-analysis on this yet. But there are plenty of reviews um, out there already on, on looking at the effect of ziralinone on fertility. Uh, and it's commonly known that pigs are particularly sensitive to ziralinone. Um, and um, clinical symptoms are seen at uh, 1 to 3 ppm in prepubertal gilts. And um, at levels of 3 to 10 ppm, you also see it in cycling sows and gilts. Why does um, ziralinone have an effect on, on fertility? It's because the structure of ziralinone is actually very similar to estrogen, and therefore it can bind to the estrogen receptor, and that's where it's causing the hyperestrogenic effects, which will then be seen as irregular heats, abortion, low conception rates, um, embryonic losses. An important fact to, to um, know about ziralinone is that it's um, metabolized in the liver. Um, to either alpha or beta zeralinol. And what's interesting here is that the beta zeralinol actually has a much lower affinity to the receptor compared to zeralinol, whereas the alpha zeralinol has 90 times, 92 times higher affinity um, for, the, for the receptor. So, you know, by converting the zeralinol into this alpha um, zeralinol, you're actually making the um, problem worse. And what they have also shown is that there's a difference between species. Um, in a pig, the liver microsomes dominantly convert ziralinone into alpha ziralinol, whereas in cattle and poultry, it's actually um, converting it more into beta um, ziralinol. So this might also explain why pigs generally um, are more susceptible to the effects of ziralinone on fertility compared to poultry and then also cattle. So coming to T2 toxin and its effect on, on pigs, generally there's a lot less data available on, on the effects of T2 toxin, but what is being reported is that the effect is lower compared to the effect of, of DON on pigs. So um, there has been some reduction in performance being seen um, in response to 3 ppm in the feed. When it comes to um, effects on fertility, yes, there has been some reports and it will affect fertility, but this was on really high levels of T2 toxin, so 12 to 24 ppm, um, and at 1 to 2 ppm in the last third of pregnancy, um, there was some inhibitory effects on, on ovaries. So again, um, T2 toxin, I, um, there's not that much data available out there yet. That's probably also why um, there's not a lot of guidelines um, on T2 toxin yet. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's some data in, in the scientific literature. So coming to poultry and the effects of the ziralinone, DON, and T2 toxin on poultry, this is um, looking at the meta-analysis um, carried out on 98 broiler trials. Um, and what you can see here, again, ziralinone, even at an average level of 5.05 ppm in the diet, there was really no significant effect on any of the 
um, growth performance parameter, so feed intake, growth rate, FCR, production efficiency intake, was not really significantly affected by Zerial and non-embroilers, but Dawn at 4.29, so an average level of 4.29 ppm in a diet, had very significant effects on feed intake, growth rate, FCR, and production efficiency. But if you compare it to pigs, obviously the effect is not as high as, as it was seen in pigs. D2 toxin, again, um, you're seeing significant effects on, on growth performance parameters, but the effect is not quite as high as um, um, with Dawn. Apart from when you look at the production efficiency index, the T2 toxin um, effect is greater compared to Dawn, but that's probably because um, T2 toxin has a bigger impact on mortality than Dawn, as mentioned in the trials. So some further evidence of how T2 toxin affects um, um, poultry performance. So this is um, a, a review carried out by Denike in 2002, and they concluded that at levels of 3 to 4 ppm of T2 toxin in diet, you will see an effect on, on growth performance. And ducks have been shown to be much more susceptible, so there you already see some impact at 0.4 ppm of T2 toxin in the diet. When it comes to xeralanon, like I say earlier on, um, there's no effect on, on growth performance parameters, on fertility, um, in mature chicks, even up to 8, point, uh, up to, at 8 ppm in the diet, there was actually no effect on reproductive performance reported based on the reviews. Um, but there was some um, effect reported in female turkeys at levels of 1 ppm, and it showed reduced egg production by about 20%. Looking at the effect of the mycotoxins in ruminants, Again, here the data is um, very limited, and um, I haven't found uh, a meta-analysis um, on, on, on data yet. But there was quite um, a comprehensive review, recent review on, on scientific literature, um, which I looked at to um, present you some of the, the figures in, in these presentations. Rumens are generally less susceptible to mycotoxins just because um, of the room microbiota. Room microbiota can actually um, degrade mycotoxins into less toxic metabolites. And this is why ruminants generally have been found to be less susceptible to the effect of mycotoxins. But that also depends on um, the production stage of the animal um, and um, also the level. So more stressed and highly producing dairy cows, for example, they are a lot more susceptible to the effects of mycotoxins. And also the amount of concentrate in the diet will have an impact on the rumen capacity for detoxification of um, mycotoxins. Because if you have more concentrate in the diet, you have a lower pH in the rumen, which will affect some of the rumen microbes that could actually be um, degrading mycotoxins. So, like I said, um, this is coming from some reviews that are um, more recent reviews that are found uh, in the scientific literature on the effects of mycotoxins uh, on, on ruminants. And here they reported levels of 0.3 to 4.4 ppm of dawn um, that having an effect on um, rumen efficiency, so by showing reduced um, NDF digestibility and also a reduction in microbial crude protein. And at levels of 4.4 to 5.3 ppm, um, you could also see a reduction in, in milk fat. Ziralinon at 250 milligrams per heifer showed redu a reduction in conception rates, whereas at 500 milligrams um, per dairy cow, there was actually no effect seen. But if you, this is like just looking at um, individual contaminations of diet, but if you look at diets that have been co-contaminated by Don and Ziralinon, um, you can see that um, you actually require much lower levels to see some effects on fertility or also production. Um, 0.5 ppm plus 0.75 ppm, uh, 0.5 ppm Don plus 0.75 ppm of Ziralinon. There you actually already see some unsynchronized ovarian cycles, and 3.5 ppm of Don plus 0.24 ppm of Ziralinon. There's a reduction in feed intake, milk production and also an influence on metabolic parameters and immune response scene. T2 
Ketotoxin, again, it's, this is a difficult mycotoxin because there's not a lot of data, data available on this in the scientific literature. And it, so far, there's no information available for dairy cows and beef cattle. But there is information on calves and lambs, and that's where um, 0.3 milligrams of ketotoxin per kilogram body weight. Um, there was actually some effect shown on you know, hemorrhages and lesions in the gastrointestinal tract and also some changes in metabolic and immune status. Milk contamination, that's an important um, issue um, when it comes to, to dairy production. You're probably all aware that aflatoxin can be carried over in milk, and this is why um, it's highly regulated in feed. And when it comes to T2 toxin, Don and Ziralanon, and there's less of a concern because um, data has shown that there's very little carryover of Don, Zon, and T2 toxin into milk, so no significant concern with respect to the safety of dairy products for consumers. Something I also wanted to highlight here, because this is something that you can actually see that easily or measure that easily in response to, to mycotoxins, um, is the effect on, on, on a cellular level. Mycotoxins can also um, have a negative um, reactions or stress reactions. Um, in, in the animal, so that's sh been shown as oxidative stress, reduced gut integrity, or also increased inflammation. And all of these um, reactions um, cause the animal to use more um, energy unnecessarily, which it cannot uh, use for production purposes. So it's reducing the efficiency of the animal. And if we talk about 70% of production costs coming from feed, this is obviously you know, a high impact on, on profitability as well. So coming back to the um, issue of co-occurrence of mycotoxins, why will we also find um, two different types of mycotoxins occurring together in one feed? There are three reasons for that. Most fungi are able to simultaneously produce a number of mycotoxins, so we've heard earlier on Fusarium um, can actually produce uh, Dawn, it produces um, Zeralinone. Commodities can be contaminated by several different types of fungi. And also, if you're talking about complete feed, I mean, it does contain a number of different um, commodities, so each of them could be con contaminated with a different type of, of mycotoxin. So this is why you will get co-occurrence of mycotoxins happening in, 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 in the reality. And there is also now um, a very recent um, meta-analysis uh, looking at um, or comparing the effect of an individual mycotoxin on, on performance in pigs versus um, combined levels of mycotoxins in feed and on the performance in pigs. And what you can see here in the table is that the same mycotoxin concentration showed a much stronger effect on pig performance when present in combination with other mycotoxins compared to then a single contamination. So if we look at feed intake here, for example, when you have an individual mycotoxin in the diet, um, you had a 14% reduction in feed intake compared to the control, and when you had combined mycotoxins present in the diet, it was actually a 42% reduction in feed intake compared to the control. So there's quite a big difference um, when um, you know looking at either having just an individually contaminated diet versus a combined mycotoxin contaminated diet. So taking a quick look, uh, again, comparing the effect of an individual mycotoxin on versus combined mycotoxins. This is looking just at um, growth performance, so the reduction in growth performance in pigs. What you can see here from this graph, again, obviously, the um, combined mycotoxins in feed is reducing the um, growth performance quite considerably more compared to the individual mycotoxin, and what this graph is also showing is that a lot of this is actually coming from an increase in reduction of feed intake compared to um, just the individual mycotoxin in the feed. Also, um, coming back to um, the effect of mycotoxins on um, metabolic efficiency, this is showing that around about 6% or 6.5% of the reduction in growth performance is actually coming from an increase in, uh, increase in maintenance energy of these animals. So again, there is evidence um, showing that um, mycotoxins will reduce their efficiency, feed efficiency as well. 
Last but not least, having a quick look at the impact of mycotoxins on pets and the data um, you know, that's reported in, in pets. In dogs, um, DON has been shown to have uh, to reduce feed intake at 3 to 4.5 ppm in a diet, whereas cats are less susceptible to this and there um, it's about 7.7 .7 ppm that is reducing the um, feed intake in cats. So cats is, are less susceptible to the effects of DON compared to dogs. To two toxin, um, what the data is showing there is that at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, the main effect was actually seen on, um, on the intestines or showing some gastrointestinal stress, distress in response to ketotoxin in dogs. And tiralinone again also is showing um, effects on fertility in, in, in dogs. Here um, they reported levels of 5 ppm, reducing the number of corpora lutea and arrested spermatogenesis in female and male dogs. What is also um, being reported is that um, some of the levels of seralanone can also predispose female dogs to pyometra, so that is an infection of the, of the uterus. Guidelines on mycotoxin tolerance in feed can help to assess the risk, but don't take into account the effect of co-contamination. Um, recent data from meta-analysis studies can help to get an objective view on the commercial impact of mycotoxins. So I think it's a um, you know a nice reference to to have a, a look at that. Um, pigs are the most sensitive animal to zeralanone. So if you are dealing with high levels of zeralanone in a feed, the people in this audience that are supposed uh, are most should be most concerned about these levels are the ones that um, have breeding pigs. Um, effect of DON and T2 toxin on maintenance required and feed efficiency should not be ignored. And the biggest negative impact of DON is on feed intake. That was across species. So I hope you now have a better understanding of, of what the current um, reported mycotoxin levels mean to your operations. And something that you should bear in mind is that mycotoxin service uh, cannot replace monitoring of mycotoxin levels in your own diets. Um, and when you regular monitor your feed for mycotoxins, you have a much more realistic view of the current risk to your own operation. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. This has been a great, uh, great morning and a great amount of information. We would like to get maybe uh, at least a couple of questions in. Uh, probably one for Duarte and one for you, Gwen, and then give you each a, a chance to offer any you know, closing comments uh, as well. Uh, because we have more questions coming in than, than maybe time uh, might permit, uh, we will uh, collect all of the questions and uh, circle these back uh, to the presenters, and then uh, we'll figure out a way to uh, send answers to all the questions out to the uh, registrants of the of the of the webinar so you have uh, have some additional uh, additional reference points to uh, take away from today's webinar uh, this uh, this first question uh, Duarte if, if you're still there I'd like you to maybe take it I'm here. Uh, could you accurately predict the future mycotoxin problem years, or, or perhaps how can we accurately predict future mycotoxin problem years? And then if you had any final closing comments, feel free. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the, the only thing that's harder than predicting what molds will do is predicting what the weather will do. So I think, uh, I, I think we have some general understanding of what kind of climate uh, events uh, and type of crops and crop systems are associated with mycotoxin contamination. So we, we can, in essence, make some very educated uh, guesses uh, on what would be a problematic year based on, on our knowledge of, of, of historical events. Uh, having said that, um, you know, in the 20 years that I've been trying to figure this out, I, I keep on telling people that, that uh, moles must not read the, the same books or articles that I read because every time I think I understand uh, what's going to happen, it, it, it gets flipped. 
uh, on its side. So I think in essence, yeah, we, we can be fairly intelligent in our assessment of what the, the situations um, can arise and what can be problematic. Uh, but I think there, there is no sus substitute for, for analyzing and getting a, a down on the, on the ground level a picture of, of what's actually going on out there. Um, the, and that's, that's by far the, the best way. I think what we should do is to, ba based on our knowledge of what potentially can increase the risk, set up uh, more aggressive monitoring protocols to, to get more information. So again, if, if, you, if you have a situation that, that looks like it's going to be a problematic year, uh, then you need to increase in your sampling protocol uh, or your freq sampling frequency, uh, the number of samples you're, you're analyzing for mycotoxins to, to get a better picture of that. Um, yeah, so in, in, in closing, I, again, I just wanted to thank everybody. I hope we, we, we got um, some questions clear for a lot of the people out there. I know this is, this is fairly complex and sometimes uh, it seems kind of frustrating, but we're, we're trying and we're, we're doing our best and hopefully by, by sharing this information, you guys uh, left this webinar with a little bit more knowledge of, of what to expect. Great, thank you, Duarte. Uh, this question will be uh, for for Gwen. There's there's a lot of good ones here, but I'll try to uh, pick one I think, uh, and then your your comments. Uh, question is for Gwen. I heard that uh, EFSA in the uh, European Union is evaluating the risk of T2 toxin on animals. Do you think they will come up with guidelines for T2 toxin? Yeah, actually, um, also saw some some information on that when I was um, reviewing. Um, the information um, for, for this presentation. I mean, the current um, uh, guidelines are based on, on an opinion um, out of 2011 on T2 toxin in, uh, by EFSA, um, but more recently um, they have been trying to um, look at also some of the um, uh, modified forms of T2 toxin and, and the potential sort of risks from, from that. So still um, looking at this whole thing, um, they have established um, a tolerable daily intake of 0.2 micrograms per kilogram of body weight, and this is based on data in rats. Um, but um, the conclusion so far is that they still need to have more data to make a proper assessment of the risk and not to overestimate the, the risk of T2 toxin. Sure. So, okay. yeah, it's still in, in progress of being evaluated. Okay, well, great. Thank, thank you very much. But just, again, wanted to be sure that the folks attending today uh, show Neogen as a leader in mycotoxin foods and food safety services and support. Uh, our new product line, Q Plus Max, uh, for aflatoxin, and actually all six toxins will be aqueous-based. And we, uh, we believe in taking an integrated approach and helping our, our partners, our customers with their mycotoxin management through educational uh, events like today, through our mycotoxin handbook, uh, training, uh, certifications, reference material, uh, a wide variety of, uh, of services and support, uh, because as the presenters have talked about, this is, uh, this is much bigger and much uh, more significant than, than simply the tests themselves. So with that, uh, if you have, uh, have uh, questions for any uh, Neogen uh, representative, please uh, let them know that you uh, attended uh, this webinar and they would be happy to talk with you about some, some testing formats if you'd like to uh, see what the, the T2 levels are in your feed or grain or Xarelinone. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got some great programs and great products to offer you. So thank you for everyone today and uh, we appreciate your attendance.